Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Maureen Conway. I'm a vice president at the Aspen Institute. I'm executive director of the Economic Opportunities Program, and I am so delighted to see everybody here at this uh, five-year celebration of upskilling. Um, we have been eagerly preparing for this event for a while now, and it's just a thrill to be here and to have you all with us to celebrate upskilling. Um, uh, so uh, as we celebrate, I thought first I would just tell you a little bit about the Economic Opportunities Program um, and why upskilling is so important to us. Um, the Economic Opportunities Program mission is to advance strategies, policies, ideas that can help uh, low and moderate income people in the United States really connect to economic opportunity and find ways to thrive in today's changing economy. Um, we believe many organizations and, and actors need to play a role in that work. Uh, nonprofit organizations, government agencies at all levels, uh, labor organizations, education, institute, education institutions, and importantly, business. Uh, and Upskill plays a critical role within the Economic Opportunities Program in engaging business and thinking about how do we invest in our frontline workers, how do we help them develop the skills and capacities they need to thrive and to advance their careers. Um, today, as we all know, too many people are struggling to get by. Uh, while unemployment is low, too many jobs don't pay enough, uh, and too many just don't have enough paycheck to pay the bills at the end of the month. Um, we also know that uh, race, ethnicity, gender, and geography play an outsized role in who has access to economic opportunity and who does not. Uh, and so a part of our work at the Economic Opportunities Program is to really think about how do we engage a variety of actors to address those divides so we can all thrive together. Um, at the same time, we also know businesses are faced with rapidly changing technology, a competitive global business environment, um, and they struggle with how do they develop the workforce that's ready to meet the, this challenging context. So Upskill really engages business at the intersection of those challenges and helps companies find new ways to invest in their workforce and address the needs of both workers and business. This work is vital to building strong communities and thriving businesses, as well as thriving families. Upskill grew out of Skills for America's Future, which was launched in 2010. And I just have to mention that was launched with the vision and inspiration of Penny Pritzker, um, who later went on to become Commerce Secretary. Um, but we were delighted to have her vision and leadership in creating Skills for America's Future. Um, uh, in 2015, with the Obama administration, we launched Upskill, um, and uh, we have Eva Sage Gavin here with us, who you'll hear with later, who uh, then really was with us at the founding of Skills for America's Future, took on a leadership role. Um, Nick Pinchuk will be joining us later. We're so delighted about where that work has gone, um, and we're really proud in particular of the past five years of the work of upskilling. Um, we're excited to share the great work that employers, together with elected officials, government leaders, and community organizations are doing and the insights that can offer others as we try to spread this movement. But of course, the work is not done, and our real goal is to think about that forward look and think about how do we, all of us here, uh, play a role and what do we hope to achieve in the next five years. Um, so just briefly, I want to I want to say, uh, in terms of our overview of today's event, we'll have a few um, introductory remarks, which I'll introduce next. Uh, we'll be having uh, three uh, panel conversations that we hope to engage you in: how large employers think about upskilling, the value of local and regional initiatives, and perspectives of program graduates. And we'll conclude with uh, a keynote from Nick Pinchuk of Snap-on. We will have a short break at 2:30, and we'll welcome you to a reception at the end of the day. Um, I want to very much thank Accenture, the Lumina Foundation, Pearsa, Pearson, Strata Education Network, Steady.com, and Walmart for their support and sponsorship of this event and for their thought partnership and support of this work. We could not do this without them. Um, I also want to note that we are 
um, live streaming and we are recording this event. So I do ask that you silence your phones, but I do ask that you uh, join the conversation on Twitter. Our hashtag is upskilling. And now it is my honored privilege uh, and great pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, Dan Porterfield. Um, we are particularly excited to have Dan join us today, uh, not only because he leads the Aspen Institute and uh, he's my boss, um, but also uh, because he's really dedicated his career to many of the principles Upskill America stand for and that we stand for in the Economic Opportunities Program. Um, he's really um, had a, a tremendous career in expanding educational opportunity and increasing inclusion. As president of Franklin and Marshall College and during his tenure at Georgetown, major part of his work really focused on how do we include more low-income students and students of color in educational opportunities. Um, at FNM, he helped triple the college's percentage of incoming low-income students and more than doubled its percentage of students of color. Uh, Dan really recognizes the importance of e expanding education opportunities and the role it can play in expanding access to economic opportunity. Um, so we are just really thrilled to have Dan with us here today. We're so grateful for his support for all of the work of the Economic Opportunities Program and for his leadership of the Institute as we really sort of are charting this course as a whole Institute in addressing some of the economic divides and challenges we have today. So please join me in welcoming Dan Porterfield. Thank you, Maureen, uh, for that introduction and for all of your work. Uh, Jamie, thank you for everything that you've done to make this a success so far with more great things to come. Um, I, let me say a word, of, express a word of gratitude to our many sponsors, uh, Accenture, the Lumina Foundation, Pearson, Strata, Education Network, Study.com, Walmart, for making this gathering possible. Um, for 70 years, the Aspen Institute has had as its purpose for existence to work towards the creation of a free, just, and equitable society. And those are big words. And new strategies and new conversations and new solutions are needed in every era. Uh, this is very much a part of that future-focused work that we believe is crucial to living our mission as an organization that drives change in a way that empowers people and communities to live free lives, to be able to use their talents at work and in civic life, to be able to take care of their children, and to be able through work and through personal and community life to develop the greatness that's inside of them. That's, the, that's what we're all about here, is to try to structure our work in order to promote an economy that works for all people, not for some, but for all. And it takes a partnership of the private sector, of government, of uh, scholars and practitioners and leaders like those that work at the Asp Institute, um, uh, public intellectuals, and especially workers in the community identifying for um, all of us what they're looking for, what their hopes are, what they need. And there's just a, an enormous, eminent moral calling, I believe, to this effort. Um, because what it's really all about is helping people use the gifts they have so that they can live the productive lives they want to lead. And our economy is changing so fast. The technological revolution is disrupting um, not just jobs, not just fields, but communities and societies. And as a result, we have to respond sort of rationally and think, so how do we put power in the hands of people to develop themselves so that they can live free and independent lives in an economy that offers opportunity but is changing and changing fast? Um, every field, agriculture, transportation, education, healthcare, uh, manufacturing, um, you name it, it's changing because of technological change. And on top of that, we have demographic change. And so every service field, is, in, is inevitably changing. The only thing that's not changing is that we have a lot of change. <laughs> and we have to be able to put our minds and our experiences and our communities together to find the practical, workable solutions so that people feel they have an ownership and opportunity stake in our society. 
which means addressing the drivers of change so that we can prepare people to be able to work. It also means addressing some of those terrible long-standing conditions of structural racism, uh, of glass ceilings, um, and a fear of the newcomer that also are part of the equation, even as technology is changing uh, and as uh, the way that our country fits into a global economy is changing. Can't be hopeless about this. Uh, every time we make gains because an employer um, like Starbucks invests in the learning of its workers or because another employee like Walmart helps figure out uh, a, an even better approach to upscaling um, or because um, a government gets out of the mindset of how we always do things and helps invest in innovation so that we can get more people feeling they can participate with the lives they want to lead. Every time we have those kinds of victories, we have to use that through the way we publicize it and the way we engage others and inspire others to keep going, to do more. Because this isn't something that's just like a one-time fix of a set of recommendations, then you're done. This is an ethos. The ethos is constantly challenging ourselves to partner together, working rationally to invest in a constant development of the greatest asset any society could possibly have, the only one that really matters, and that is its actual people. I really want to thank you, Jamie and Maureen, for what you're doing to make sure that the Aspen Institute is on the front edge of that moral calling of making sure that with all the other things going on in life, we stop and invest in the American people and helping people use the talent they have to live the lives they want to lead in partnership with many, all key to the kind of progress we hope to drive. So I hope that today's gathering is both a, a, a moment of appreciation for our work together uh, and the progress made since 2015, and at the same time is also um, a burning platform for more change, the building of more narratives, more facts that show the progress that can be made when people of good minds, as Dr. King said, and good hearts put their bodies in motion for change. Thank you so much for what you're doing here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. That was fantastic. I think you all can see now why we're so excited to have Dan here with us and for Dan's leadership of the Institute. It's really uh, inspirational. Thank you. Um, and now I get to introduce another inspirational person, uh, Eva Sage Gavin, the Senior Director of Accenture's Talent and Organization Practice. Uh, Eva, as I mentioned, was a founding member of Skills for America's Future Advisory Board in 2010. She served as Vice Chair of Skills for America's Future from 2012 to 2016 and really played a critical role in the creation of Upskill America in 2015. Um, at Accenture, she's not just a leader within her organization, and with her clients, but across the world of training and workforce development. Um, she has an incredibly impressive career at the C-suite level, and I think you have biomaterials of her. Um, she's just really got an, a tremendous amount of experience, but what's amazing is, is, the, is the degree to which Eva has always been willing to take the time to be engaged with nonprofits, with policy work, to help think about and advocate for programs that build people's skills and help them move ahead. Um, she is a longtime friend of the Aspen Institute, and I count her as one of my friends, and we are so grateful for you being here. Uh, she's given so generously of her time, energy, and wisdom over the years. Um, at heart, she has a deep love for education, is a supporter of expanding opportunities and learning in a variety of ways, and really shares our passion for fostering inclusion, and she's just been an incredible champion of women's leadership. She's been an important uh, role model and mentor to so many of us. Uh, and so it's just really my pleasure to welcome Eva Sage Gavin to the podium. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, I wish my 24-year-old millennial daughter were here. She works in technology um, because I think we all look different in the eyes of our families and our communities. And I want to thank you. Uh, for inspiring me. What an honor to be back here. I'm actually celebrating my 40-year college reunion later this summer, and it feels like it's reunion season soon, Jamie. Um, so a couple of um, points to supplement and to complement the inspiring remarks we've heard. The idea of developing the greatness inside of each individual is what motivates me, and um, a call occurred to me in the crisis of the 2008-9-10 um, period uh, from uh, uh, Penny Pritzker, who became Secretary Pritzker, to ask the employers in America 
to come together to solve this. Um, six of us uh, came together in this extraordinary convening that I do believe only Aspen could put together. And you've mentioned this safe place where everyone who's passionate about achieving human potential has gathered. So I see, and you'll hear from old friends, um, uh, you know, a lot of this would not be possible without Nick Pinchuk, the CEO of Snap-on, who's been the chairman during the time that I served as vice chairman. Uh, we saw Maureen's continued and continuous leadership. Um, and in a moment, you'll see some of my other colleagues who've served as director over the years that take these visionary ideas, they turn them into policies, to practices, to programs. So if I can zero in for a second, my space and my small contribution is convening the employers of the world, but particularly those thinking about US competitiveness, to talk about what can we do collectively to really tap into the individual greatness, to lift individual workers, to lift their families, and to lift the communities and societies in which they live. A little bit of a background, um, I am a former chief HR officer. I've worked with workforces as large as 350,000, and today at Accenture we have a workforce of 500,000. So I'm speaking as a practitioner, um, and many of my colleagues will talk about, you know, how do we bring that industry perspective? What did we do in 2015? How did Aspen take that and illuminate it with other colleagues to deliver what we're seeing in 2020? And then, Ellie, you're going to be next <laughs> talking about the amazing work you're doing um, throughout society, but particularly at Walmart. So just a little bit um, of a walk uh, in memory lane um, back to 2015. Um, many of you recall that um, we were still coming out of 2008, 2009, and um, many individuals were beginning to see the effect of automation. And this idea of if technology affects me, how can it be an enabler for growth? How can it unleash people's aspirational learning paths? How can they access it um, in ways that are workable for their families and their communities? How can employers invest in it, and how could we harness that with policymakers, with community and civic leaders, and bring together unique combinations of problem solvers, thought leaders, and inspirational leaders? Um, since then, and I'm looking at 10, 18 months later in July of 2016, this original group that launched, as Maureen said, in October of 2010, had done the following things. 100,000 workers had received training that could lead to higher skilled jobs, 10,000 workers earned degrees and credentials. So this was in you know, a pretty quick period. Um, 5,000 workers were promoted into higher uh, paying positions, and 500,000 workers um, receiving pre-employment pre training. So think of the American Association of Community Colleges, public and policy makers, chief HR officers, chief learning leaders, and the entire economic opportunities leadership team with other leaders at Aspen lifting all of us to get into a um, holistic, unleashing human potential mindset. Um, we were lucky enough during those days as well to get support from the Walmart Foundation and really focused on how do we share it? So it's not just um, that one employer found a way to get frontline workers access to opportunity, wealth creation, and security for their family. And back then, Walmart launched the upskilling playbook for employers. Think of it, many organizations don't have the um, resources of some that we represent. Um, and if you can get a playbook into their hands, either digitally or in any other manner, now you're affecting more communities, more lives. Maureen mentioned Skills for America's Future. Well, we had very uh, strong success in Chicago, and that became Skills for America's Future, which trans, uh, transitioned to Upskill America. One of the main missions is to share knowledge, accelerate opportunity, and it's back to your point, Dan, about unleashing the potential in every human being to, to realize their dreams and be able to take their families, their communities, and society with them. And we're all in that common mission, coming at it from different expertise. Um, today, we have a network then from those early days of six employers in 2010 to over 5,000 businesses, 5,000 businesses and organizations across America. Um, we have put in apprenticeships, training, education opportunities. Um, we have workers growing their skills, and um, you'll have the pleasure on one of our panels today to meet some of the individuals who are graduates of these programs and their amazing and inspiring stories. 
Having said that, I have been dedicated. This is my mission. And um, I first uh, got into this at age 24 when Emanuel College in Boston asked me to teach graduates how to do resume writing and get a job. And um, I saw the power of pride and confidence and the dignity of employment. And I think you'll hear that from Nick. And that was when I began my passion that this is what I do in my free time to change the face of how we think about access to opportunity, particularly for those who may be underserved or might not have unlimited resources to access it. So with that, the 5,000 businesses, increased education opportunities, there is so much more to do, though. This morning, a group of extraordinary thought leaders convened about what's the latest and greatest. How do we think about the effect of um, automation? 75 million jobs we believe will be affected, and 130 mil million new ones will be created. How does everyone feel like they can be part of that emergent and new digital economy? And how can organizations like Aspen bring all the thought leaders together to create that access to opportunity? Um, having said that, I do spend the bulk of my time. I've had the honor of serving as a, a board director on three technology boards, and there's so much to do. Um, Accenture's at Davos today, and we launched a study two years ago that said 97% of executives um, or of workers in uh, firms see the opportunity for incre increased learning. But at that time, only 3% of CEOs were looking at that as a strategic investment with a high ROI. I'm thrilled that three years later, we're starting to see that be closer to 20%. But the reality is everyone in this room, everyone watching this live stream, um, we're not far enough. There's more to do. And we want to um, really get to every individual who wants to access these opportunities. So I uh, would love to get onto our panel. Um, I loved your idea, Dan, about the only thing that's certain on change is change. Um, and this idea that workers are ready. This idea that they're not, we've done a lot of research at Accenture, 67% of workers see development of their skills as their interest and responsibility. 85% um, of workers say they'll invest and use their own free time to learn new skills, to be resilient to economic opportunity, to take advantage of it, um, and to um, be part of this new and growing economy. So upskilling, new skilling, we've heard lots of phrases to um, talk about um, what I like to call as lifelong learning, economic resiliency, and lifting communities and society is what we'll talk about for the rest of the day. And I, I can't think of everyone else, anyone else who would be better talk about you know, living it every day. Um, Ellie is here, Ellie Bertani. She's the senior director, and she's the portfolio owner of digital transformation and rescaling re for Walmart USA. And um, Ellie looks at Walmart's ways of working, preparing for the future of work. Um, I know you work with the senior leadership team of Walmart. Um, how do we build agile? How do we build focused product teams? Great place to work. Um, incredible background. Um, Maureen embarrassed me, so I feel I need to at least give two lines to embarrass you. Joined Walmart in 2013, uh, Masters of Public Administration from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And her MBA is from the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, Ellie has worked across so many sectors, but 15 years in nonprofit, public, and private sectors, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the US State Department, Third Sector Capital Partners, and Rotary International. So um, if I can uh, ask Ellie for you to be uh, joining me and um, help us think about this unleashing potential. Thank you, Eva, for that lovely introduction. And welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to be here today. Uh, I was going to start this talk uh, with a bit of a sort of middling joke uh, on how much I've been a fan of Aspen for so many years, how I have always wanted to go to the Ideas Festival, but have never yet secured an invitation. And I was told by my corporate affairs team that one does not joke about the invitation list to the Ideas Festival. <laughs> Apparently, that is a bit of a hot button issue. So there you go. No jokes for you today. It's all downhill from here, folks. But seriously, it's truly a privilege to be here and share some of the work that Walmart is doing in the space of learning, as well as our broader vision of where we think workforce development is going over the next three to five years and Walmart's responsibility in this space as the United States' largest employer. Let's see if I can use this right. 
Sam Walton, our founder, had a vision of this responsibility. In fact, he thought of it as our secret sauce, as our competitive advantage. He called it ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I hope by the end of this, you'll understand how the investments that we are making in upskilling and reskilling are helping our associates achieve those extraordinary things. I'll preface this talk by saying that I know there are likely many Walmart skeptics in this audience. They tend to be in most audiences. We, we are a very polarizing company. I certainly was very skeptical but hopeful when I joined Walmart seven years ago. Personally, I would not have lasted seven years without truly experiencing the mission-driven culture within the company. We are not perfect, and we have not always made the perfect choices or told our story well. But the reality is that Walmart is about as authentic an actor uh, and provider of socioeconomic opportunity as you may find in this country. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things doesn't happen by itself. It happens only through a culture of discipline, of excellence, and of investment in our people. Some of you may recognize this face, many won't. This gentleman is Greg Ferran. For five years, up until November of last year, this was our Walmart US CEO. Greg had an astounding career in retail over the span of 40 years and multiple continents. He turned around the Walmart US business, which was struggling in the shifting retail environment and delivered 20 quarters of consecutive comp sale growth. What you may not know about Greg is that he never received a college degree. Instead, he learned the way that most people do, working on the job day in and day out, doing some things well, making a lot of mistakes along the way, being resilient in the face of failure, and committing to continuously learn each and every day. Having managers and leaders that saw his potential and invested in him through formal training and informal mentorship, who corrected him when he was wrong and encouraged him when he succeeded, building his confidence and his skills along the way. One of my very best friends in the business, a woman by the name of Lara Schock, is leading one of the most complex store transformation initiatives that Walmart has ever attempted, reorganizing our store teams to create inspired and empowered team members that serve our customers with excellence. Lara is a brilliant leader at Walmart, so accomplished that a few years back, she was selected to be an Aspen Institute Job Quality Fellow. Lara and I had been friends for five years before I learned that she never completed college. I share Greg and Lara's stories because theirs are common at Walmart across every area of our business. There are Greg's and Lara's everywhere, which surprised me deeply when I first stepped into Walmart. The largest company in America has very few individuals with Ivy Leagues walking its halls. Credibility at Walmart's comes from what you can deliver, not where you come from. This holds true for all levels of our company, from cart pusher to CEO, and is borne out in our statistics. More than 75% of our store management teams are promoted from our hourly ranks. When it comes to removing barriers to advancement, we walk the walk. Our company has been a belt, again, by ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So let's talk more about how upskilling contributes to advancement at Walmart. Over the last five years, we have been very focused on developing the systems and culture to enable opportunity and growth for all associates regardless of their role or background. I'll briefly talk about two major investments that we're making in this space. First, academies. Over the last five years, Walmart has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in the development of over 200 high quality in-person training locations uh, located next to our very best stores and distribution centers. New managers re receive two to six weeks of paid training at academies on job-specific retail and leadership skills when they promote into role. Courses are typically 20% classroom-based and 80% hands-on experiential learning on the floor of the facility taught by professional facilitators. In addition, academies are used for change management to train associates on new tools, new processes, and new initiatives when they roll across our organization. We're proud that our curriculum is of such high quality that associates can now receive up to 19 college credits for the paid training they receive through the academies. The academies have hosted over 1 million training events since their launch. Next, 
Live Better You. When Live Better You launched in June 2018, Walmart took a pioneering step in providing all associates, part-time, full-time, hourly, and salaried, access to debt-free education, including free high school and language programs, and college degrees, career diplomas, and certificate programs for just $1 per day. What makes this program unique, we think, is our core focus on completion as the most critical success metric. Every element of the program has been designed to help maximize student completion rates, including personalized weekly coaching services from our key partner, Guild Education, careful selection of our educational providers that demonstrate best-in-class results for adult working learners, and articulation of Walmart Academy's training for college credit, which accelerates students through their degrees. Today, associates can access over 80 degrees and certificates from nine education partners, all aimed at preparing our associates for the future of work, whether at Walmart or elsewhere, in areas such as IT, business management, supply chain, and healthcare. As of today, we have nearly 12,000 active students in the program, and our first college graduates matriculate, matriculate this month. I've had some people ask me if all of this represents a moment in time, or rather, is it a lasting change in approach for employers? Are these new programs here to stay, or are they simply the product of the tightening labor market? Is it only skills needs, or is it a cultural change in which companies are becoming more focused on their purpose as good members of their communities? These are the right questions to be asking, because the reality is those of us in this room care deeply about the long-term sustainability of this type of work. I think we also realize, however, that if the private sector is going to fill a gap that some argue should be supported by the public sector, we need to demonstrate a clear return on investment. Behind the scenes at Walmart, I think I can say with confidence that we have put the bet to bed the question of whether or not investing in associate opportunity makes sense. The return on investment is clear. Five years ago, our company was struggling. Stores had dramatic variability in customer service and process execution. There was little consistency in how leaders set expectation or led their teams, and the company was slow to change and adapt, even as change became more necessary and more frequent. While we can't, certainly can't attribute all of our turnaround to our learning programs alone, I will tell you that much of our recent success has come from the consistency, the discipline, and the nimbleness that our Academy's programs have established. It's hard to run a company with over 5,000 discrete locations. It's hard to keep the army of 1.2 million people marching in the same direction. But it's a lot less hard when you can run all 1.2 million through a consistent training program in a matter of weeks. The ROI is there. Similarly, although it is certainly not cheap to help associates earn college degrees, we also recognize that in the knowledge economy, the workforce with the best skills will win. This holds true at every level of the organization, not just in the corporate home office. At only 18 months into our program, we are excited to see the impact already on advancement rates, skills translating into higher performance, and on retention, particularly of our top performers. Walmart is an extraordinarily complex business. We see in our data that those who grow up through our company tend to be more successful than those who enter from the outside. Thus, it only makes sense that through programs like Live Better You, we can not only invest in our associates, but then also career path them into critical roles within our business. To finally convince you that this is not just a moment in time, but a true sustainable strategy, I'll give you a peek into how we see our learning programs evolve over the next five years, because we will continue to invest in this space. Two things I'll share with you now. The future of frontline, frontline associate training and our vision of a data-rich, personalized learning environment that truly transforms the learner experience. Today, our frontline workforce does not reap all of the benefits of the Academy's programs. Instead, newly hired associates are trained through a program called Pathways, which is primarily a computer-based learning experience where associates sit through module at the back of the facility and learn what they need to learn. Although it was state-of-the-art when first built, it's beginning to show its age. Instead, imagine, if you will, an environment in which continuous learning is central to the store, in which every department has at least one, if not more, trainers who train associates in real time on the floor as they do their work. These trainers identify training needs specific to each associate, 
pull up short videos, checklists, or even augmented reality demos, and coach associates as they work side by side together. As associates learn new skills, their trainer validates their proficiency and issues badges, confirming their achievements, which stack to master credentials. These badges and credentials unlock the ability for associates to work in new areas of the store, to pick up different scheduling shifts, and even earn more money. These credentials are articulated for college credit and accelerate their achievement of degrees. Associates share their career goals and receive personalized recommendations based on their performance and interests of new learning pathways for them. Gone is the one-size-fits-all expectation of training, which we know frustrates some, leaves others behind, and frankly, wastes time and money. In this future, career paths are more transparent, opportunities are matched to experience, and associates are empowered to take their learning as far as they wish. So, what have we learned through this journey over the last five years? We've had some successes and some failures, and we try to learn from both. A few key thoughts I'd like to share with you here selfishly in hopes that you may have some ideas that can help us solve some of the many challenges we still see. First, we have found that creating learning communities and the social capital that comes with it helps accelerate and reinforce learning. This has been an unexpected but delightful consequence of Live Better You, in which our university partners fill classes with Walmart associates cohort style as they go through their core college curriculum. We now have community of, communities of associates across the United States who support each other on their homework and projects, but also with work, family, and other life challenges in a way we never could have imagined. They help each other succeed. How do we design more programs that build communities of learners to keep them engaged, motivated, and connected? Second. As a society, we need to understand more about what instills a growth mindset in people and what inhibits it. Having a willingness and curiosity to learn and the self-confidence to make mistakes, get up, dust yourself off, and try again. This mindset often spells the difference between job success and failure. How do we all become resilient and confident regardless of our starting point, like Greg and Lara? As a subset of this question, we also need to understand the role that trauma plays in limiting learning success. Many of our associates have undergone trauma at one point or not another in their lives, in their youth or adulthood. How do we help them move beyond these experiences so they can thrive in their lives today? Third, we must remove as many barriers as possible, big or small, if we are really committed to seeing people succeed. This is not because people are lazy or incompetent, which sadly is a stereotype our associates face in society too often, but rather because life is complicated these days. From the cashier to the executive, everyone feels stretched too thin and seems to be juggling more and more. We know, for example, that obtaining your high school transcript as you try to apply for college is an incredibly frustrating and difficult process, even for the most motivated adult learner. Our partner, Guild Education, is working to help us innovate to make this as simple as possible. Similarly, we know that asking our associates to pay for their college tuition up front and have us reimburse them is easier to operationalize than prepaying their tuition and then truing it up on the back end. But we also know that in a society where almost half the population has less than $400 in savings, this is a real barrier that puts their finances at risk. If we are not designing simple, frictionless processes to enable learner success, we are frankly not living up to our principles and vision. Finally, I'd like to end with a brief story of one of our store associates who exemplifies the very best of the culture of learning we are trying to instill. This is Amani Karfa, who came to the US seeking asylum for religious persecution from Nigeria two years ago. He began his career at Walmart unloading trucks. Though he completed his last year of high school in the US, because of his immigration status, he could not apply for financial aid or receive scholarships. When he heard about the Live Better You program and the fact that he could earn a college degree for only a dollar a day, he applied and is now earning his bachelor's in computer science with a concentration in software engineering. Zamani is inspired to help his siblings that are still in Nigeria, and he works hard every day at school and work with them in mind. I'd like to share a short video of him sharing his thoughts in his own words. 
Oh no. I think you can understand from this video why we are convinced of the return on investment of our learning programs. Inspired associates work hard, stay with us, and hopefully aspire to and achieve a long career ladder at Walmart. It's so easy to be skeptical in our short-termist, polarized, self-centric world. I feel so lucky to be inspired by the people around me, many of who have not had the benefits of privilege and stability that some of us in this room have enjoyed, but who have proven themselves with a little help from Walmart's low barriers to advancement in our investments in learning. Zamani represents tens or perhaps hundreds of thousands of associates across the US. Just think of how amazing our company and our nation will be when we unleash the potential of all the Zamanis, all of the ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Thank you.